Uh, I'm switching topics uh, to a talk about um, what is hopefully, very likely, uh, the most important experimental discovery uh, in our subject in the last 30 years, at least in particle physics. Um, and uh, this is the, obviously, <coughs> the very likely discovery of the Higgs, um, perhaps likely discovery of the Higgs at, uh, at the LHC. Um, uh, and just, uh, just as a little logistical thing, I'll, 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 I will talk about this. Um, and uh, I, I guess whoever is interested in continuing to hear about the story that we got to at the end of last time, um, I guess we'll go back to that uh, after this is done. The experimentalists, okay. the experimentalists should certainly leave <laughs> because you will probably not talk to me again <laughs> if you keep uh, <laughs> right. So um, okay. So um, so this uh, this this uh, famous seminar at CERN, for which I, I must say um, I, I was extremely proud of our field for how the experimental talks were given. It was uh, it was really it was really great. Um, um, uh, with the sort of eyes of the world on CERN, it could not have been a better, uh, at least in my, in my opinion, it could not have been a better illustration of what a fantastic field we have and, and what a dedicated and uh, how, how hard it is to discover the truth and um, how careful you've got to be and how long it takes, but that it can eventually happen. I think it was, it was, it was very inspiring, not just, uh, not, just, not just to the outside world, so even, even to us. So, but, so I want to briefly talk about some of the implications of, of this, uh, <coughs> of this uh, discovery. And of course, the, the zeroth order point is that we're finally in a very data-rich era uh, in, in fundamental physics. And actually, it's a little bit to the theme of, of, of uh, my, 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 my lectures here. The most obvious way, sense in which we're in an incredible era of uh, data is all the experimental data that's starting to pour out of the LHC. And those of you who, um, uh, who are following this know, but those of you who don't uh, may not appreciate. I mean, there are those of us who have been thinking about physics beyond the standard model for a long, long time. And just the amount of information that's coming out of the LHC is of such high quality uh, and is so useful and is telling us so much about the structure of the physics at the weak scale, it's just hard to keep up. Okay, that, that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just fantastic. And the difference between now and five years ago is like night and day. This is despite the fact that there's no official big discovery, we haven't seen supersymmetry, blah, blah, blah. But, but the data is spectacular. And it's so good that we're already learning a huge amount. Okay? At least I'm, I'm learning a huge amount. And, um, uh, and uh, Seeing some hint of the Higgs at the end of 2011 is the cherry on top of a wonderful pie. Um, and uh, what I want to do is talk about what some of those impl implications are. There's another sense, but this is the theme of some of the rest uh, of, of my lectures and many of the other lectures in the school, which is also, I think, very exciting, although unrelated to this, is that we're also in an era of a huge amount of theoretical data. <laughs> in the sense that all these wonderful explorations in all these different directions of what's going on just in the structure of good old-fashioned quantum field theory is, I think, a real way of the future for, for theoretical physics. It's, it's a way of thinking about and learning very deep things about things we ultimately care about, the nature of space-time and perhaps even the nature of quantum mechanics, but in a way that isn't speculative. You're mining and understanding the structures that are there un under our feet and you know when you're screwing up, you can check your results, and there's an ocean of data about good old-fashioned quantum field theory there that needs to be understood and organized better. So that's been a lot of the theme of many of the other lectures in the school, the other lectures that I've given so far. But I think this is what's so exciting to me about uh, the, the, the period that we're in, is that there's just amazing amounts of data on all fronts. But of course, uh, this lecture is all going to be about the implications of uh, having the Higgs at 125 GeV. Now, there's all the usual caveats about this. We're supposed to be ultra conservative and not declare victory until it's uh, been seen at five sigma by both experiments, and that's fine. But uh, um, I can tell you that my gut feeling and the gut feeling of many of my friends is that I would say with more than 
confidence, it's been seen, and it's going to be there in this neighborhood around 125 GeV. And what that really means, these numbers are meaningless, what it really means is that uh, it's my default that that's what's been seen until proven otherwise, which may well happen, but I think the most fruitful thing to do with this wonderful piece of information is to take it seriously, imagine that it's correct, see what it would imply, and if it turns out to be wrong, I would be surprised, but, uh, but I think it's the best attitude to take right now. Um, So whining and complaining never gets anyone anywhere. You know? So you try to do something positive at, at any time. I think we got something positive and it's worthwhile taking it seriously. Okay, so what are the most zeroth order implications? No, this is a very important point. Uh, it's not a joke, okay? This is a very, very important point. The fact that we've seen a Higgs at 125 GeV is the triumph of weak coupling. Okay, that means that that uh, strong dynamics as an explanation for electroweak symmetry is dead. <laughs> okay? Many people thought it was dead before, but not everyone thought it was dead. Um, uh, and I think it's just dead. We've seen a weekly couple takes. Okay? This is, I think, incredibly important. It is unfortunate that the way we teach the standard model, and the way we teach electroweak symmetry breaking in, in, in to a graduate students, is to make the Higgs look like the boring thing um, and make other things, other mechanisms to break electroweak symmetry the exciting thing. It's exactly the other way around. Okay? This is why I would have, and I've been saying this, people who know me know that I've been saying this for years and years, I would be depressed as hell if it was strong dynamics for electroweak symmetry breaking. I would feel like I wasted 20 years of my life thinking about physics at the weak scale if it turned out to be strongly coupled electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay? The reason is that that's what we've seen over and over and over and over again everywhere else in nature before. Okay? Everywhere else in nature before, when we've had a large hierarchy of scales, it's been the same explanation over and over again. Marginal coupling, dimensional transmutation, generated an exponentially large scale, done. Okay? We have never seen before, in a state of nature, this effective field theory of a weakly coupled light scalar. We've never seen it before, in a state of nature. Where have we seen it before? The only time we've seen it before is close to phase transitions where someone from the outside, an experimentalist, has fine-tuned the system to be close to a phase transition. Okay? That's the only situation we've seen this before, but in, in a normal state of nature, we don't see it. What we see instead over and over again is well, dimensional transmutation, strong coupling, large, large scales generated. That's how superconductors work, that's how QCD works. Every other example that we're familiar with, that's how large hierarchies are generated. So one of the big knocks against particle physics, to me, when I was a kid, was who the heck cares? You know, you go, you discover more particles, it's like peeling back layers of an onion, layer after layer after layer. You spend 30 years, you peel back one more layer, you find one more effective theory. Our condensed matter friends get to play with thousands of effective theories. They get to engineer them and screw around. We have to spend billions of dollars and then wait 30 years and we go one more layer. This is not a way to spend one's life. This, this was my, my feeling. And so, right around when, when I personally entered grad school was when LEP started making a, a strongly coupled explanations of electric symmetry bre breaking look very implausible from precision electric weak constraints, never mind all the difficulties from flavor and so on beforehand, okay? But that played, a, for me personally, a huge role into going into particle physics because it was very shocking. It was very shocking that we seemed to have some direct evidence for something not like what we'd ever seen before. In fact. This boring, weakly coupled scalar is the most exciting thing that we could have found, because we've never seen it before in nature. We've never seen it before in a state of nature. Okay. People often wonder, why should we be so lucky as to discover something as incredible as, and radical as supersymmetry? Okay. And I don't know why we should be so lucky, but there's, the, the hint for it is that there's something unlike anything we've seen before in, the, in, uh, in electric symmetry breaking. Beforehand, only indirectly through precision constraints. Now, finally, through the actual observation of a light weakly coupled takes. And as I said, we've never seen it before. The only other time we've seen something like this is this situation. There's a bunch of uh, electrons with their spins lined up in the same direction as far as the eye can see in a metal. This little sentient electron in the middle is sitting there wondering why the heck it is that all the spins are 
are pointed in the same direction. It's a very strange thing. There's huge thermal fluctuations. Why are they in such an interesting place where all the spins are localized, are pointing in the same direction? And the answer on the outside is that there is somebody on the outside who's twiddling the dials and arranging it to be in this. Okay? So that's the only time before we've seen this in nature. And now we're finally seeing, we don't know it's that for sure, but we're finally seeing, we're finally seeing that, kind of, that kind of theory show up. So that's why it's so dramatic and interesting. And in fact, this has been, uh, this, this, uh, this fact that the only time this has been seen before is in uh, cases where there's fine tuning, is a reflection of the famous hierarchy problem. And the hierarchy problem has been the central motivation for there being physics above our head at the TeV scale. There's lots of other motivations, gauge coupling unification, well, supersymmetry, dark matter, all this sort of stuff, none of that requires particles at the hundreds of GeV scale. Okay? Even WIMP dark matter does not require particles at the hundreds of GeV scale. The so-called WIMP miracle, that the particles are at, uh, at the TeV scale, the WIMP miracle is the following. If you have a particle, let's say we have, we have a, just take a simple thing, an electric doublet, okay? Just, just a simple particle that couples, that, that interacts with Ws and Zs, we go through the, the, the freeze-out calculation to get some relic abundance, and the mass that it needs to have is one TeV. It, there's no other funny interactions, it's just the electroweak interactions. The WIMP miracle says that the mass that it needs to have to be dark matter is one TeV if it's a doublet. If it's a triplet, it needs to be two and a half TeV. It okay? does not remotely guarantee particles at the hundreds of GeV scale. And let me tell you, uh, if you, if you don't know, that we will not, even at the LHC, directly produce electroweak charged particles directly if they're heavier than three or 400 GeV. Okay? So this argument of, of even dark matter does not remotely guarantee that we are going to see new physics at the TeV scale. Whether we like it or not, the central motivation for seeing new physics at the TeV scale in an accessible range has been the hierarchy problem. And I say whether we like it or not because this is something that has never been perfectly sharply defined, exactly what we mean by tuning, how tuned is tuned, and so on and so forth. But whatever it is, that's been the best argument the whole time that we're going to see some physics beyond the standard bubble. And it's a fantastic argument. Okay? It's a very, very good argument. Uh, um, but it, it has had from the get-go, from 1980, uh, it is uh, actually from 1977 when Technicolor was first, uh, was first proposed, um, it has had the following basic tension. On the one hand, we want to add lots of new physics at the TeV scale in order to solve the hierarchy problem. On the other hand, we have indirect evidence. Uh, well, on the other hand, the, the standard model all by, uh, all by itself provides a beautiful explanation for many approximate symmetries that we've observed in the world. Baryon number, lepton number, uh, the, the size of flavor changing neutral currents, CP violation, the small size of CP violation. All of those things have a beautiful explanation within the standard model, and they all arise as accidental symmetries. Okay. So they're a beautiful explanation if we imagine it's a standard model and nothing else up to very high scales. And then just as a property of the leading marginal couplings in the low energy theory, we get these approximate symmetries. That is naively completely smashed when you add a lot of new physics at the TeV scale. For example, baryon and lepton number, if we just write down operators suppressed by some high scale, they've got to be suppressed by roughly the gut scale, 10 to the 13 TeV or so. Okay? There's many, many more operators involving flavor and CP violation uh, that have to be suppressed roughly by scales between hundreds and thousands of TeV. Things like KK bar mixing, BB bar mixing, uh, epsilon K. Um, all of the precision physics from B factories, the fact that all those things agree with the standard model, if you just write down higher dimension operators, they would have to be suppressed by, again, scales that are much, much higher than the TeV scale. So this has been the whole reason there has been such a thing. There's existed a field beyond the standard model building. Okay? It isn't just a bunch of yahoos who sit there and invent one stupid crazy model after another with no constraints. In fact, there's been a huge constraint from the get-go. You want to solve the hierarchy problem, you have to add a bunch of things, but you have to understand why these things aren't there. Okay? So the whole time, this has been taken as a hint of not a problem, but an opportunity. Okay? That there's some structure to the new physics that's coming in at the TeV scale that's not random, and is going to explain why these things aren't there. Okay? 
And that's the, you know, that's the bread and butter of a model builder, is you sit there and you try to imagine what the new physics can be and how it addresses these problems. And this is why it's a non-trivial activity. And this is why in 25 years of thinking about the hierarchy problems, you know, roughly two solutions emerged. It's not the sort of thing that you do, you know, that any idiot can come up with a solution for, okay? <coughs> now, the best solution to the hierarchy problem is supersymmetry. It's, it's the best from any point of view. It's the deepest, it's the deepest theoretical idea. We'd be luckiest if we discovered it, in the sense that we'd learn the most about nature. It's a wonderful extension of uh, space-time symmetries. But ignoring that aesthetic criterion, it is the only extension of the standard model that addresses the hierarchy problem that has had quantitative successes. Okay? And the quantitative precision successes are the famous ones of the unification of the coupling constants and I think I drew this backwards, alpha. No, I drew it right, okay, I drew it right. So the precision percent level unification of a coupling constants with superpartners at the TV scale and dark, dark matter. And when this picture became clear around 1990, it was completely spectacular, okay? Uh, maybe those of you who don't know the, the history, uh, people were thinking about unification of couplings and the fact that they might unify uh, at short distances, starting from, from George I. Glashow and George I. Quentin Weinberg in the, uh, the mid-70s. And by the early 1980s, when the supersymmetric standard model was first, writ was, was first written down, um, the, the prediction, the picture of unification that came from the standard model was in better agreement with data than the one that came with the supersymmetric standard model. So it took some courage for the model builders who were proposing supersymmetry and doubling the world and adding all these crazy extra particles to go and say, yep, that's what's going on. And by the way, unification is worse than it was in the standard model. And yet, as often happens, it solved the problem. There was some theoretical problem. There was something deep about it. And the experimental values changed. The error bars shrank, always in such a way that each new experiment's error bars were within the previous ones. But by the time they all converged, of course, the standard model was way off, and it was at percent level agreement with the MSSM. So supersymmetry in 1990, and certainly 1993 when I entered graduate school, um, was spectacular. And that was, I think, it is, that's, that's the best it has ever looked. Okay? And since then, it has had, at least in, in my mind, a logarithmic decline. Not a power law decline, but something has been bothering me and bothering some other people in the intervening years. It has never been clear how big a deal these little issues are. Um, and uh, they may not be a big deal. But what's going on with the Higgs now is starting to dovetail with these quiet worries that were in the back of our head, um, or funny feelings about what might be going on. And that's what I want to uh, talk about. The sort of bottom line, uh, uh, just to jump ahead for a second, the Higgs, the way we found it, looks basically supersymmetric. Okay? That's, that's my feeling. It looks basically supersymmetric. But I think in more detail, it's not going to be a perfectly natural version of low energy supersymmetry. But it's going to involve some degree of fine tuning. A degree of fine tuning that in 1990 would sound absurd. I think I'm going to argue for a picture of the world with a degree of fine tuning to a part in 100,000 or a part in 10,000, 100,000, a part in a million. That level of fine tuning. Um, which might have sounded absurd 20 years ago, but I think is more reasonable now from a theoretical point of view, from a number of other points of view, and I just wanna, I wanna talk about that. So the zeroth order, it looks supersymmetric. First order, it's not, uh, at least the picture I'm going to uh, talk about is going to be one where it's not perfectly natural, and I'll talk about what some of the implications are. I should say, these are, uh, this is a lot of what I'm talking about is a review of some ideas that, uh, that, that a number of people thought about, but, but uh, I thought about together with Savas Demopoulos back in 2004, going under the general rubric of what's called split supersymmetry. And the idea of split supersymmetry, in my view, and I think the view of a lot of people, is gained more support if the Higgs mass is at 125 GeV. It's in a perfectly nice location from, the point of, from that point of view, and it's, and it's in a more, less nice location from a standard point of view. But I'll also talk about how things could work out from the standard point of view as well. This is, not, uh, this is not, really a, it's not really a polemical talk. I just want to tell you the sort of different options I, I see for what this, this might mean in a supersymmetric picture of the world. Let me just pause one moment, because here everything is within supersymmetry, and we're arguing about perhaps uh, 
things, that these sort of first order questions about how natural it is going to end up looking. Before moving on, I just want to make a quick comment about other classes of theories. Okay? So strong dynamics is dead, thank God. Uh, but, uh, but there are other classes of theories where, for example, it's strong, strong dynamics at 5 or 10 TeV, but the Higgs comes out as composite, either as a pseudo-Goldstone boson or even more special versions of pseudo-Goldstone bosons called little Higgses and so on. The first class of these ideas, where it's literally a pseudo-Goldstone boson, is in huge trouble with 125 GeV Higgs. Okay? Uh, and um, it was really already in a fair amount of trouble with 115 GeV Higgs. It was hard to get it that heavy. Okay? And up at 125, it's, 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 it's in worse, if, even worse trouble. Roughly speaking, I'm going to talk about a sort of very well-known issue with getting the Higgs heavy enough in low energy supersymmetry. Even up to the left bound was slightly non-trivial. Non up to 125 is harder still. But those problems are magnified for theories where the Higgs comes out in the simplest way as a pseudo Goldstone boson. The reason is in those theories, the only way that Higgs picks up any kind of potential at all is through its coupling to the top quark. Its coupling to the top quark, on the one hand, if you don't do anything special with no special theoretical structure like the little Higgs structure, that coupling on the one hand, as a power law, as a quadratic divergence, generates a mass, but only logarithmically generates a quartic coupling by the renormalization group. And so in order to get the Higgs heavy enough, you have to make the log bigger and bigger, but then the power divergence is getting worse and worse. So already 115 GeV Higgs was causing the simplest versions of these uh, Higgs of pseudo Goldstone boson theories, fine tuning at a worse level than we were somewhat worried about with supersymmetry. And it's even worse still at up at 125. Of course, since people had run into this trouble, they invented already a second version of these theories where the potential was dominated by ultraviolet interactions with, uh, uh, interactions with heavy particles up, up in the UV. The problem there is that in those cases, the Higgs naturally wants to be 200 GeV or 300 GeV. <laughs> okay? The peculiar thing about 125 is that it's so close to, to the Z mass. Right? It's so close to, to the neighborhood it needs to be for low energy supersymmetry. But at this detailed level, it's, it's off a little bit. It's, it's heavier a little bit. So the composite theories undershoot or overshoot. Theories with Higgs as a pseudo Goldstone boson under, naturally undershoot or overshoot. So while, again, it's not a theorem, to my mind, had the Higgs been 250, it would have looked pretty nicely like a composite Higgs to me. 125 does not look like it, basically at all. Okay? So I really think we're talking, at least in my own mind, and I say this as a person who's worked on all these kinds of theories before, okay? so I'm being, uh, I'm being ecumenical. right? Uh, it just looks like either the standard model or some version of supersymmetry. What we're debating, in, in my mind, is in the supersymmetric context how natural it is going to look. Okay? So here is the review of what started this uh, logarithmic, uh, logarithmic uh, decline. And uh, this is something which is referred to in in many different ways, and there's a number of related problems. Oh, there's no pointer. Oh, well, uh, I'll just use my hand. But there, there's a number of related problems that goes into the general rubric of what's called the little hierarchy problem. Um, <coughs> and uh, as I said, there's a number of related aspects of this problem, but let me say what, what I think the, the most serious version of this problem actually is. Uh, in other words, often this problem is presented uh, as something like supersymmetry is this much fine-tuned. It's, you know, getting low energy supersymmetry to work is already fine-tuned at the 3% level, 5% level, 10% level, 1% level. Intelligent people should never have this discussion about how tuned <laughs> tuned is and this and that, okay? Um, but in fact, I, pr I prefer to think of it not, uh, not in some qu quantified tuning sense, but in a more parametric sense. Low energy supersymmetry could have, and in many people's minds reasonably should have looked quite a bit different than it seems been, 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 been observed already a long time ago. Okay? And let me tell you the argument. In fact, uh, very sober people, not me, you know, like very serious Italian theoretical physicists um, who will remain nameless uh, because of what I'm about to say, but trust me, very serious people, not, you know, not, uh, not over-enthusiastic people, very serious people, uh, really strongly believe that SUSY would be discovered at lap one. This particular theorist that I'm thinking about actually bet a number of his, told a number of his students that if SUSY was not discovered at lap one, he'd cut off his right testicle. Okay? Uh, I don't think he went through with it, but, uh, but he, he really believed it. Okay? 
Um, so this is not John Ellis, it's not Gordy Kane, okay? You know, like, uh, so, okay? So it's, uh, right, that's right. I, I know I said that, but I just want to make sure, okay? You can maybe start guessing who it is, but, uh, um, but anyway, but this, this, this is the reason, uh, this is the reason people had this uh, thought. After all, this is supposed to be a theory of the weak scale and of electroweak symmetry breaking, and the W and the Z are not at 1 TeV, they're at 80 GeV, 90 GeV. But in a little more detail, uh, th this, is, this, this is the point. Take some typical supersymmetric spectrum. No matter what is going on at short distances, the colored particles get heavier under the, under the, under the renormalization group as we scale from high to low energies. High doesn't have to mean the gut scale, even at 10 or 100 TeV. It doesn't take much. And the colored guys tend to get heavier than the uncolored guys as you scale to low energies. So there's a rough expectation that squarks are heavier, squarks and gluinos are heavier than sleptons and winos and binos. Okay, that's rough expectation number one. What about the Higgs? The Higgs isn't colored. However, the Higgs enjoys the strongest interaction of all in the standard model. It has a top Yukawa coupling. Okay? That means that the Higgs mixes very strongly or the Higgs soft mass parameters mix strongly under the renormalization group with those of the stops. The stops are colored and are amongst the guys that are getting heavier. So what you would expect, and you've perhaps seen pictures like this, where you start from some high scale and the Higgs mass squared goes negative as you scale to a low energies, right? What you would expect is that, uh, maybe this is what the picture looks like. You start up here at some high scale, the masses are comparable, you know, the Higgs is getting dragged with the stop. Maybe the stop gets heavier. The Higgs gets driven negative, just because that's how it works out with the renormalization group. But the overall scale of this mass and that mass are comparable to each other. Okay? That's, that's, that's what you'd expect. If that was the picture, then the Higgs soft mass, which sets the weak scale and the Higgs mass, should be comparable to the stop, comparable to the Z. And so this would be the picture that you'd expect that the Higgs, the stops, the gluinos, and the Z would be closer to the top of the spectrum. Okay? And that the sleptons and the winos and the binos would be underneath them. And this is why it was not insane for these people to think that Susie should be discovered at LEP. Okay? <laughs> There's tons of particles that could have been there beneath the Z that could have been discovered at 90 GeV. <laughs> okay? So it's this really, it's this parametric problem. This is what the spectrum quote unquote naturally, maybe should have looked like. But instead, what we have is a situation, if low energy Susie is indeed realized in the world, the situation looks more like this. Yes, it's true that the Higgs mass squared is comparable to the stop most, most of the time in this flow, but we magically run, run, run until it goes negative and it just crosses zero and we stop running right there. Okay. A third of an e-folding, after it crosses zero, we stop. There's a very strange coincidence. There's, there's a scale where it crosses zero on the one hand, and the overall mass scale of the superpartners and of the Higgs on the other hand, and they're coincident to a third of an e-folding. Okay? That's what it needs in order to accommodate that the Z and the Higgs are at the bottom of the spectrum and we don't know where the top is. Okay? So that's the parametric problem. The Z and the Higgs could have been closer to the top of the spectrum. Instead, they're completely at the bottom of the spectrum. And we don't even know where the rest of it begins. <coughs> so I, this is the theorist natural spectrum. This is natural from the point of view of nature, what we've actually seen, nature O. Okay? Uh, and uh, the problem is that nature O isn't the same as nature O. Okay. Now, in the MSSM, there's a milder version, a milder cousin of this problem, which is the one that somehow gets the most press. Um, and that is that uh, the Higgs mass, uh, because the Higgs quartic coupling is related to gauge couplings, which is coming from D terms, just in the simplest uh, MSSM, at tree level, the Higgs mass is lighter than the Z mass. It's a very simple consequence of the fact that the quartic coupling is G squared, and it can get smaller than that because there's D flat directions in the MSSM. So, uh, so if you go further along D flat directions, the quartic coupling gets smaller still. But, uh, but if you're lined up even somewhat away from the D-flat directions, the quartic coupling is basically G squared, and so the tree, the tree level mass of the Higgs is the Z. Okay? But it's bounded from above by the Z mass. We've known for a long time that the Higgs isn't lighter than the Z. So of course it's possible to make the Higgs heavier than the Z. 
provided you break the supersymmetric relation between the quartic coupling and the gauge coupling. So if once Susie's broken, there is indeed a difference. Okay? And in fact, the, since the, the Higgs has big couplings to the tops, what really matters is where the stops are. Okay? So if the stops are up here somewhere, after we integrate out the stops in the low energy theory, now there's supersymmetry is no longer saying that the quartic coupling and the gauge coupling are the same. So the quartic coupling starts to run uh, and be different than g squared and actually gets a positive contribution running to lower energies from, a, from the top loop. Okay? So this is the, the correction that you get that's logarithmically enhanced uh, relative to where the stops are as you go down. Okay? So it's a somewhat hard way to make a living because, uh, uh, because uh, you have to, uh, it, it, it is a log. So if you want to make a big change in the quarter coupling, you've got to make the stops heavier and heavier, but you can do it, okay? So, now, this problem with the left bound on the Higgs was, as I said, the milder version of the little hierarchy problem and already forced the tuning of at best 10%. As it is a milder version of the problem, the bigger version is what you get. There's this more parametric problem I mentioned a second ago. But, this, but, but that more parametric problem could be in our minds. Maybe we haven't found the best way of uh, the right theory of SUSY breaking, the right way of generating the spectrum. So that's why perhaps we should ignore the first problem. But the second problem is much more unavoidable. It just tells you where the stops have got to be. There's a purely low energy contribution to the Higgs mass going up to where the stops are. To, to, uh, the, the quadratic divergence the biggest quadratic divergence in the standard model, maybe I should write this formula down. The biggest correction to the Higgs mass, oh yes, the, the biggest correction to the Higgs mass comes from the, you know what, I, I hope you don't mind. Sorry. The biggest correction to the Higgs mass comes from a loop of the top. Okay? And is numerically around 0.3 times the UV cutoff squared. Okay? So it's a loop, but it's 0.3 times the UV cutoff squared. That means that if you want really want the theory to be natural, the Higgs at 115, which was a left bound, the stops should not be heavier than 400. And yet, in order, to, in order to use these logarithms to get the Higgs heavy enough, you have to push the stops to a TeV. Okay? So that's it. Totally unavoidable. Completely unavoidable. Purely low energy contribution to the tuning, already 10%. Maybe we don't care about 10%. That's fine. Okay? But I just want to stress that, that that was the problem before. And that was already a source of unease. Not a huge deal, but just a source of unease uh, with LEP. I'll keep this open in case I need it again. Now, with the Higgs up at 125, again, in the MSSM, this has gone to a percent, okay? Really, just going from 115 to 125, that's now pushing the stops to 5 TeV or 10 TeV, okay? And so that's, that's starting to make just this picture look more tuned. Now, in the MSSM, exactly. Now, this could be totally not a big deal, right? So let's just talk for a second about how it could be uh, totally not, not a big deal. The reason is that there's other ways that we could get a uh, positive correction to the Higgs quartic coupling. Okay? There's basically two ways. There's only two ways. It's a supersymmetry breaking effect, necessarily, for the reasons that we've said already. So either it's coming from non-decoupling F terms or non-decoupling D terms. Okay? What I mean by non-decoupling is that, is that uh, if we have some heavy particles and we integrate them out supersymmetrically, and their spectrum is supersymmetric, it won't make any difference. So it has to be a situation where we have some new particles with SUSY breaking in their spectrum, we integrate them out, so we can we get a shift, a non-supersymmetric shift in the coupling. That's what I mean by non-decoupling. Non okay? And the whole question is whether the source of the correction is, is coming from a superpotential or coming from uh, or, or coming from the Achaler potential. In this side, the very simplest thing, very popular simple thing, is so just add a singlet to the supersymmetric standard model. This is called the next to minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay? And you just see right, right away. From here, there's a correction to the quartic coupling uh, for the Higgses, which is just lambda squared h up h down squared. 
You see why it matters that it's non-decoupling? Because if you integrate this, if the singlet had a mass, a supersymmetric mass, and you integrate it out, this quarter coupling would go away. So we're imagining the singlet has a nice big soft mass, supersymmetry breaking soft mass. So at tree level, when we integrate it out, we are left with this shift in the quarter coupling. So that's perfectly fine. And well, here's, here's, a, very simple here's a very simple formula, just to remember uh, exactly what, the, uh, what it is. So there are these, there's still radiative corrections from the stops and all the rest of it. That's what you get from the MSSM. And this is the boost that you get from this additional coupling. Okay. Tb, that's just tan beta squared. So, so the small, small thing here is that the quarter coupling is h up, h down. So uh, <coughs> for the single light Higgs that we're seeing, uh, this, this uh, uh, if tan beta is a little bit big, H down only has a small amount of, uh, of the physical Higgs in it, so this contribution is actually suppressed at, uh, at uh, large tan beta. But anyway, this is what it is. All right, great. Now, we can further do different things with this. Of course, you see, there's no problem at all. We could say lambda is 3, and we're done. Okay? Huge, big, positive contribution, no, no problem. Okay? We can even make it 125. We just make tan beta big, we make lambda 3, and we're done. However, if lambda is 3, that coupling blows up in your face at 3 TeV. just has a lambda pole at 3 TeV. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. Uh, it might have a UV completion into something else and so on. So purely from the low energy point of view, there's no problem. We can, we can, we can jack this up. But there are two reasons that you might want the theory to make sense to very, very high energies. I think the most, the most important reason is that this coupling that's blowing up here, so let, let's imagine this coupling is blowing up right above our head somewhere, and we go into, a, into some other UV completion of it. Okay? Uh, the problem is that these Higgses are the single most important contribution to the running coupling constants that make a gauge coupling unification work in supersymmetry. Okay? In fact, you could throw out all the superpartners, all the gauge genos, everything. Just keep the Higgs genos, and unification would be basically as good as supersymmetry. Okay? All of the scalars are completely irrelevant, because they come in complete multiplets of SU5, and they make exactly the same contribution to all three running coupling constants. So they change the value at which the coupling's, uh, uh, the, the value of the coupling where the couplings unify, but they don't change the fact that they unify. Even the gay genos are basically irrelevant. They make a small difference, but they're basically irrelevant. The lion's share of the job for unification in SUSY, it's a little ironic. But the lion's share is being done by the things that are not in complete multiplets and are the two Higgs doublets. So if you have this kind of interaction and you're messing up with the Higgs genos, there's no guarantee that the UV theory is going to give you the same contribution to the beta functions for the, for the uh, standard model couplings as you get from the low energy theory. And in every known example I know of where people have done this game and tried to UV complete into something, it never works. Right? You, can, you can, of course, add random particles, but there's never a natural way to make it work. I mean, this is, we're, we're, we're taking a hint from low energies from the fact that the couplings unify, is that this perturbative picture is making sense to very high energies. So if you want the physics to be, oh, a second reason to not want to have these couplings be really big is if they're really big, the Higgs could have naturally been 200 or 300. It's funny that it's so close to MZ. It would be an accident that it's so close to MZ. What it looks like is a small kick compared to MZ. That's just what it looks like. Okay? And so it makes sense to try to limit this thing such that you have a nice perturbative picture all the way up to the gut scale. If you do that, it's, it's very simple. Lambda's got to be less than around 0.7 or so. And th this, is how, this is how the uh, numbers work out. Let's imagine that this is what the left bound was before, just to uh, calibrate what, what we need. Then you can do it. If you push this about as big as it can be, uh, then this extra contribution that you get for a moderate tan beta, three, four, can boost this up to 125. Okay? So that, that's perfectly fine. Sorry? Nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm saying that if you were happy before, with using stop loops and whatever to push it up to 115, then you can add this as well to push it up to 125. So roughly speaking, what I'm saying is that the situation with natural supersymmetry, now with 125, is like the situation for natural supersymmetry at LEP, but you've got to add a, a dipsy doodle, okay? So the MSSM before with 115 was something. If you were happy with that, you have to 
the thing that you've got to add takes it up to 125. Okay? Now, the other situation is equally simple. The other way of doing it is equally simple. By the way, none of this is rocket science. This is all completely trivial. Uh, there's you know, thousands of papers on it that have, you know, that have been written from the 1980s, 90s, 50 of them uh, after the seminars came out. But the, you know, these are all, you know, the, these are exercises my, my, my graduate students could do in half a day, okay? So there's, uh, there's nothing to any of this. They're all obvious points, but I'm just reviewing obvious things. The other thing that you can do is take the MSSM and add a non-decoupling D term. The simplest way to do that is to just imagine that some U1 survives from very high energies. In fact, they're very nice U1s that can survive from high energies. Um, any combination of U1 B minus L and U1 hypercharge is, is anomaly free. If we imagine that we have right-handed neutrinos down at low scales. Of course, if we do that, we have to assume that the neutrino masses are not Majorana, that they're Dirac. But that's fine. We can generate them after B minus L is broken. If you're in love with the seesaw, uh, relation for neutrino masses as being indicative of some correct kind of physics happening near the gut scale, there's even natural classes of theories where that, new, that, that, uh, that parametrics works out in exactly the same way. So this is not such a bad thing. It's a totally reasonable thing to imagine that, that, uh, that some U1 survives from high scales. And in fact, it's very natural for that U1 to actually be a non-trivial combination of B minus L and, and, and hypercharge. The reason is that B and L are not UV are not UV things. B and L are a property of the infrared standard model. Um, and so if you take any gut, SO10, bigger things, E6 and so on, the natural U1s that are spat out at low energies are, are linear combinations of B minus, B minus L and hypercharge. I'm picking one of my favorite ones, the U1X of SO10. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the generator that in five by five in, in in the notation where the generators are five by five matrices with each entry being a little two by two anti-symmetric uh, matrix is uh, zero, 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 A, A, okay? That generator. Okay, anyway, so if you have that, then, and again, if it's broken by, uh, by SUSY breaking dynamics, then we get a shift in the, in the we get a shift in the uh, Higgs mass squared, we get a new contribution to its D term, which is the G squared MZ squared, which is, which is G squared, sorry. And so this is what it is. I'm just normalizing it relative to the coupling to, to the Z. That's what the formula is. Once again, the size of the boost that you get is limited because this U1 is running and getting freer and freer, freer as we go to uh, low energies. So we can't make the G too big without the U1 hitting a Landau pole at high scales. Sorry, the important point about this being a combination of B minus L and hypercharge, I should have said, is that the Higgses are charged under it. The Higgs is not charged under B minus L, but it is charged under a combination of, U1, uh, of, of B minus L and uh, hypercharge. So if we want to avoid this U1 hitting a Landau pole as we go to high scales, this G is limited at low energies. Once again, it turns out that this ratio can be about a half at low energies, no problem. And the numbers turn out almost identical to this case, okay? If we put that to 115, and we make that about as big as it can be consistent with perturbativity up to the gut scale, it's about as big as it needs to be to take it up to 125. So these are both, I think, totally reasonable, totally fine, could well be the way the world is. I would really love it if this was true, by the way. That would be even better than this. this I, Somehow I've never liked this so much. But, uh, but, th but this, is, this is wonderful. If this is going on, we'll discover a Z prime, okay? And first of all, there'll be a Z prime. The Z prime should be around two and a half TeV, one to three TeV, I can tell you in detail later. So there should be a Z prime around one, one, one to three TeV, be copiously produced. And this Z prime will be the factory from which we'll make every single particle that's accessible to it. It'll be completely spectacular. Susie searchers will be radically different if the Z prime is around. Because you don't sit there and wait to make them in cascade decays and so on. You sit on the Z prime pole, and since it's, it has to be relatively heavy even, you know, it turns out to be one to three TeV, anything lighter than it is going to be produced in its decays. No, miss, no problems with mat, no problem. You just reconstruct them, you reconstruct the Z. It's spectacular, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's totally fine. In fact, the, the, the the, 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 current limits for, the current limits, for example, for, Z, for, for a U1X, uh, with this value, the gauge coupling is around 900 GeV. <coughs> okay? So 
and, and it's not cheating that it's, uh, really the reason it's relatively heavy, it, it's a little bit cool. The reason it's relatively heavy is that it actually needs to be that heavy for this D term to, uh, the mass has got to come from Susie breaking. That Susie breaking has got to be big enough for this D term not to decouple. And that means that you push it to be heavy enough. By the time it doesn't decouple enough to give you that size effect, the Z prime is relatively heavy. Okay? Not ultra heavy, but relatively heavy. Yeah. Of course, there could be more Z primes. And, and you know, this is, of course, one of the central things that one expects as a string theorist, is that there's a bazillion uh, U1 primes lying around. What, what we'd have to be lucky for here is that some of them are surviving down to low energies and being broken by Susie breaking, by the same kind of thing as breaking electroweak symmetry. Okay? But if I'm Okay. Well, no, no uh, the, but you see, it, it, it depends a little bit. So, 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 so this guy has a, uh, this guy has somewhat more suppressed couplings. It's a, it's, it is a detailed thing. Sorry. I haven't told you if you see that. No, I know. No, no. I'm, I'm just talking about limits. I'm just talking about limits. And, 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 like I said, it's not the standard model coupling. It's half standard model coupling. So, yeah. But no, this is definitely within reach. It is definitely, it's, it's definitely within. This is not uh, 2020 physics. This is physics of, of this year and next year, and certainly the 14 TV run early. Okay, so, okay, so this is the story, I think, to my mind, with natural Susie. But the bottom line, which I summarized, is that whatever you felt about natural Susie before to get up to 115, it's that plus something else. Okay, if you don't want to have stops at five or ten TV, right? Huh? Nope. That, that's, that's, that's not so easy to do, okay? Because, uh, uh, because both of these things, I mean, they're, 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 they're um, we, we can talk about this, we can talk about this in a little more detail later, but it's not the, uh, sorry? Sorry? They, they add, they add, they add in, uh, in a quadrature. But let, let me, this N never works, but let's, uh, let's, let me defer talking about that till, uh, till uh, later. Okay. Yes. I, the reason I'm not talking about that is that that is a horribly tuned scenario. You see, people. Uh, so l l let me l well, let me comment on this because there may be people who, who, who know about this in the audience. Uh, in the MSSM, uh, it, it's what I told you. You have to you integrate out the stops and then and then uh, you you run down to uh, low energies. Now, just integrating the stops gives you a threshold correction at the size of the stops, and then you get a logarithmically enhanced piece as you go down to low energies. The log piece, just living off the log piece, you need 10 TeV stops, 5 TeV stops, get up to uh, 125. So what people do is say, ah, we'll make the threshold correction bigger. Now, what they do is, uh, so how do you make the threshold correction bigger? You can only make the threshold correction big when the A terms are large. Okay? Now, even making the A terms large does not do it all by itself. It's not just saying they're big. Okay? They've got to be really big, and not just really big, but really big at a specific value. There is a curve. Ah, I forgot. Okay, so uh, since Zohar asked, I will, oh shoot, what happened? Uh, hmm, sorry. Yeah, let me do that for a sec. Okay, so we have um, uh, we have so 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 here it is Zohar. Okay, so we have we have things that look like this with a terms here, and also things uh, where uh, so this is this is something that goes like a over m stop to the fourth with four a terms. Okay, and there's also a contribution that's goes with the quartic coupling that's already there, that goes like g squared. So there's a piece that goes like g squared, a over m stop <coughs> squared. And there's a relative minus sign between these terms, and I think there's a 12th or something. Okay. There's, some, there's some factor. There's a 6 here somewhere. Okay. There's some factor here. Okay. So you see, even as a function of a over m top, it gets bigger and then it gets smaller. <laughs> So you've got to choose a very special value. It's something that's called maximal mixing, which is when a over m stop is root 6. Root 6. This is a huge a term. The dimensional size of the a term is huge. That means that it's making an even bigger quadratic divergence contribution to the Higgs mass than the top was already. 
So yes, the whole reason you want to use the eight terms to crank things up is that, oh, it's great, I'm keeping the stop at one TeV. That's fine, and I make the Higgs heavier. The only reason we thought stop at one TeV was OK was the size of the quadratic divergence, but we're making that worse by making the eight terms so big. That's a huge eight term. That's a, that's a contribution that's six times larger than the usual top Yukawa coupling. That's why it's not a panacea. Okay? Uh, so there's not much of a difference between keeping the stops at one TeV uh, and having eight terms of root six and having the stops of four TeV in small eight terms. Okay? And, and sorry, and, and the second point is just from many theoretical, theoretical points of view that I'm sure you know well, uh, theories with big eight terms just suck. Yeah, so uh, that's, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't want to talk about it. This focus point is complete bullshit. So we can, we can talk about it later, but it's really complete BS. So uh, uh, if you want, I can talk about it now. Uh, but, uh, but no, it's really, the fo it, it's a very sad story. Let's, let's not talk about the focus point. Yeah. The, it, yeah. Uh, there's no zero mode. There's no, I, I, I'm, it's, it's wonderful. Let me not say, uh, I'm, uh, 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 huh? Uh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, okay, fine. All right, here we go. So, it's not complete bullshit. They, they have an observation, but they're completely uh, misinterpreted. Let me, let me tell you what it is. In fact, I, I can explain it very easily from this picture, okay? <clears throat> so, this picture is what I was just telling you is what the fine tuning, is the worst aspect of the fine tuning problem, okay? That, uh, um, that in other words, they, they sort of start comparable, and under our evolution, they stay comparable almost everywhere, just except for a little narrow window where this crosses zero. There's absolutely no reason why that narrow window where it crosses zero has anything to do with the soft masses, right? There's two completely different physics that are determining them, and yet they seem to be on top of each other, okay? That's, that's the problem. Now, observation. This is the observation that was made by the focus point people. Actually, the observation was very well known to other people far before them. But uh, anyway, they, they chose to make a big deal out of it. If you, if you uh, make all the soft masses universal, okay? So that was a popular boundary condition that people talked about. If you make the soft masses universal, now, then, and if the A terms are small, so you can ignore A terms, you ignore gauge genome masses, so what you have is just a simple linear differential equation for the soft masses, okay? Oops. Simple linear differential equation for the soft masses that has this structure that's fairly familiar to everyone who has studied this, but maybe not to those who haven't. But there's something like mq squared, mu3, mu squared, for the stop, m higgs squared, and it's like 3 lambda top squared over 8 pi squared, and there's a matrix 3, 3, 3, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, mq squared, muc squared, mh squared, okay? And you diagonalize that matrix, and that's what drives the Higgs mass negative, and so on and so forth. But the important point is that if you ignore A terms and gauge genome masses, this is a completely linear equation. And therefore, the scale at which mh squared crosses zero is totally determined. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just totally determined by dimensionless numbers. And it's just determined by the boundary condition, right? It has nothing to do with the overall scale. It's just determined by the boundary condition. Very good. So you observe that if you put the boundary value to be 1, 1, 1, that the scale where this crosses 0 happens to be the TeV scale. Okay? That's what they observed. It has to do with the value of the top mass, et cetera, et cetera, but it, uh, uh, but it happens to be the weak scale. So they say, look, there's no fine-tuning problem. What are you talking about? This is exactly what happens. Sorry, this is what happens. We run, and the scale that it crosses just is a TV scale. It's a prediction of the theory. We're done. There's no fine tuning. Right? This is, I think, not only is there, is there this, is, this is the worst kind of uh, situation as far as tuning is concerned. Let me tell you why. It's precisely because this scale is totally determined here by dimensionless ratios. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the scale of, overall scale of the soft masses. It's not even tangentially related. You can't even imagine a relation between them. So what you have to do if you want to believe this picture is you have to believe the following. On the one hand, there's some physics that generates the boundary condition 1, 1, 1. 
And yeah, it's just true that it generates the scale of crossing, which is the TV scale. On the other hand, you have to believe that the dynamics that break SUSY, transmits, mediates, the scale of breaking, all of that happens to also generate, out of the blue, for no reason, exactly the same scale. Okay, So that's the very definition of tuning. It's the worst kind of tuning. It's the worst in the sense that you can't even imagine a dynamical mechanism that might relate them in this context. In other theories, you might imagine dynamical mechanisms that relate them, but here you can't even imagine it by construction. They're making, it, they're making the whole point that that scale has nothing to do with the overall scale of the soft masses. Okay? So that's what focus point is. But let me say something more about focus point. I would, let me say something more about it. Uh, just one, one more thing. For this whole picture to work, the A terms have got to be small. The A terms must be small. And so it's very hard to get the Higgs above 115. In fact, focus point already was ha having difficulty with the Higgs at 115. Higgs at 125 is very big trouble for focus point Susie. Okay? Really very big trouble for it. There was a paper that came out by focus point advocates right after the Higgs mass that said that it's spectacular in agreement with focus point Susie. And um, I don't know how they could say this. If you look at the plots in their paper, you will see they have contours of what the Higgs mass are, and the 125 GeV line is nowhere on their plots. Okay? So I invite you to look at the paper and decide for yourself how natural and wonderful a theory it is. Okay? And it's really because the A terms are small. It's a really good, beautiful prediction that the Higgs should have been 115 or lighter. 125 is big trouble for focus point. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Zohar? Okay. All right. So, how am I doing for time? Really badly. When did I start? Uh, Eliezer? How much do you need? Maybe 15 minutes. OK. All right. Now, let me make another quick comment about this. And this is all of this, uh, all of this back and forth about what looks natural and not is, is, uh, is really besides, is very besides the point. Here is uh, the really important thing to be looking out for. Which is, if we do have these mechanisms that are jacking up the Higgs mass, it is not unlikely that there will be reasonable deviations in the properties of the Higgs compared to the standard model. For example, uh, so first let me make a general comment. Let's say we have a 20% deviation in any of these couplings. Higgs to BB bar, Higgs to TT bar, Higgs to WWZZ. If we, on the one hand, if we have that size deviation, then we could get deviations in sigma times branching ratio compared to the standard model at the f up to factor of one and a half to two level. Okay? So that's a reasonable, pretty big size effect. A pretty big size effect can arise from a relatively modest suppression of these couplings. For example, if we suppress the couplings to BB bar to 70% of the standard model value, we increase all the sigma times branching ratios for everything that's been seen so far, including vector boson fusion, which is uh, something interesting to look for. We increase all of those by a factor of two. Okay? So this relatively modest change in the couplings can, can have a really sizable impact on the sigma times branching ratios, on the one hand. On the other hand, if we see something like that, there absolutely must be new, extra, and light states that are very important for electroweak symmetry breaking aside from the Higgs. And if we see anything like that, in other words, if we see any deviation in sigma times branching ratio compared to the standard model for the Higgs, <coughs> game over. There's absolutely necessarily other light scalars around. There's definitely a natural theory right around the corner. Whether or not we see squarks or super partners or anything next year, if by the end of next year there's, there's really strong evidence for sigma times branching ratio deviation at the factor of one and a half to two level, that's it. There's most certainly some natural theory there. We'll just find it. Uh, uh, soon enough, right? Sorry? Of course, that's right. So, so this is in one direction. If we see a deviation, definitely naturalness is correct. We cannot just be the standard model, uh, obviously. And uh, furthermore, the point is that if you're imagining fine-tuning the Higgs down for any reason, any anthropic reason, any crazy reason, fine-tuning a second scalar down to be light is just insane. Okay? So there's no reason for that to happen. So any deviation like that is just lights out, game over, and, uh, and it's a very strong push in the direction of some of the things that I was talking about. And this is really quite quantitative. So for example, let's say we talk about it in the context of this NMSSM. If we, if we get a 20%, a 30% deviation in this coupling, really directly tells you that there's got to be, that the second Higgs doublet has got to be lighter than 230 GeV. Okay? 
So it's just a shot. It can't be 500. There's just a number there. Nothing you can do about it. Okay? So that's, I think, very, very exciting. And that's one, one thing that whatever's happening with Susie searches, whatever, obviously we're going to be measuring the heck out of the Higgs, it's sigma times branching ratio, and any evidence for deviation is deliriously exciting. Okay? Okay. Um, uh, enhancement is uh, 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 no. <laughs> okay. The, 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 short an the short answer is no. There are some interesting things. The Higgs to WW coupling, for example, it can only be suppressed uh, by some unitarity arguments that are not dissimilar to the uh, arguments that go into all the, th anyway, by some simple unitarity arguments, with one exception. Um, if there are doubly charged, if there are doubly charged uh, uh, Higgs's lying around, you can enhance the coupling to WW. But, uh, sorry? Well, so, for, so the thing is that Higgs of gamma gamma, Higgs of BB bar, and so on, that, that, what, what we measure is sigma times branching ratio. And so the, the, depending on whether you increase or decrease the couplings to, to BB bar, to change, to decrease or increase the width, it can go, uh, it can go either way. So, so the, signs are not, uh, the signs are not obvious. I think it, what's clear, what's definitely clear, <laughs> definitely, definitely clear, is that we don't have a suppression at a significant level because the signal that's being seen is a little bit big. Okay? So if anything, the signal that's being seen is a factor of one and a half to two big in some of the channels. Um, I hear persistent rumors from my CMS friends that, there's, that they're seeing, uh, that they're seeing hexa gamma gamma in vector boson fusion, which they should not be seeing if it's there at standard model rates. They should be seeing if it's there roughly a factor two bigger than standard model rates. So, uh, so there, there are some, I would say there is very, very weak Vague hints that there might be some deviation in sigma times branching ratio is definitely something to look out for. On the other hand, we should remember that while our experimental colleagues obsess about look elsewhere effects, once you see something, there's also a look here effect. <laughs> okay? And uh, so it could well be that uh, these things are, are look here effects. I mean, my, my gut feeling is that we're going to see a, a vanilla Higgs, and it's not going to have an enhanced sigma times branching ratio, but but uh, it could well be that we do, and if it do, it has, it's the most dramatic thing that could happen. To my mind, it's the most dramatic thing that could happen in the next year, okay, is if we see significant evidence for sigma times branching ratio. It's the, it will be the first solid evidence for physics beyond the standard model. Okay, so let me just take uh, 10 minutes then to talk about the alternative possibility, um, which is, uh, since it looks like, um, Already there was some disquiet after lap. We can do these things, there's no problem, but you start thinking that you're adding extra. You see, it's one thing if we added these U1s or this extra singlet, and they were there for some, for, for some other purpose. They're really not there for any purpose other than to make the Higgs heavier here. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. A absolutely does not mean that it's wrong. The history of particle physics has not been one that rewards the idea of minimality as far as particle content is concerned. But you might think, that there's a, uh, anyway, so let's, let's explore uh, the alternative possibility. So, uh, and so really the, the, the question is you can say, look, let's just look at it, let's look at it the other way. The entire history of beyond the standard model physics has been one of fighting, fighting the obvious, which is that there's nothing there at the weak scale. Okay? You look at where the, where the higher dimension operators are, they're way above the weak scale, baron number, lepton number, flavor, we don't see them directly. We don't see them at B factories. We don't see any indirect evidence for them. The Higgs that could have been there at 90 isn't there at 115, not 120, 125. One point of view is these are all opportunities. We add more and more and more structure and discover the right theory. Could well be correct. The other opinion is maybe there's something basically, basically flawed about this attempt to think about what's going on at the weak scale. So you can ask the question, could it be that actually the weak scale is tuned? It could be. Could it be the standard model and nothing all the way up? All the way up to the Planck scale. That looks really crazy. This 10 to the minus 32 tuning, okay, that looks crazy, but uh, could it be? Or could it be a part in 10,000 tuned, a part in a million tuned, a part in a billion tuned? Have we seen any evidence for fine tuning in physics before? Okay. Well, let's uh, descend from our lofty heights of the weak scale and go down to nuclear physics. One step down, the next effective theory down. Nuclear physics is a fine-tuned theory. We can have this discussion again, David, but it's really a fine-tuned theory. Uh, uh, um, 
the, the aspects of it which are not fine-tuned, which are beautifully explained by QCD, are not the aspects that uh, are relevant for this, uh, for this uh, observation. Right. Sorry? No, I haven't calculated the binding energy, but the, well, all right. That's why I said we can have the discussion again. I didn't say what the, I didn't say what the outcome of the discussion would be, <laughs> but uh, but but it, it's it's tough. But uh, well, let, let me let me just make the let me just make the let, I'll make the statement. Okay, I'll make the statement. So the, these are just facts, and then we can decide what we think about the facts. So let's go down um, and uh, and look at uh, at nuclei. So look at the deuteron. The deuteron has a binding energy of 2 MeV. Someone tells you all the scales in nuclear physics are 100 MeV and higher. The binding energy is 2 MeV. That's pretty small. Why is it 2 MeV? It's because there's a roughly 5% cancellation between the kinetic and potential energies of the neutron and proton in that potential well. So there is a 1 in 20 tuning there, roughly, naively. Now here's something much more dramatic. Take two neutrons. Two neutrons are not bound. This is why nuclear physics is complicated, at least if, if you're a naive person. When you're first learning it, you say, oh, I, I can figure all this out. Let me just figure out what, and then you say, oh, it's so weird. Why are these things bound, those things not bound? There's no pattern until you start getting complicated nuclei, right? The reason is that there are accidents all over the place. Two neutrons are not bound. They're not bound by 60 keV. All the scales are 100 MeV and higher, and they're not bound by 60 keV, right? Yes. The pion mass, the, the uh, yeah. That, right, that's right. That, the, the range of the, right, that's true. So we, we could talk about other things. We, we could, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's, also, that's also small. The binding energy of nuclear matter is also small compared to all the other scales, right. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, uh, I, I can make a very sharp statement. So, so first of all, this is just true. It's not bound by, by 60 keV. Uh, the other way, of, the usual way of saying it is that the nucleon-nucleon scattering length is amazingly long compared to the, to the pi on Compton wavelength, for example. And uh, both of these facts are actually reflected. When I say we've seen it in effective theory down, there's an official effective field theory for a uh, few nucleon interactions that was written down by Kaplan, uh, Savage and, 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 and Mark Wise in the 90s. This is a beautiful effective theory. It, it organizes a lot of the kinds of things that nuclear physicists were doing in, uh, in, in, in the era before that. It's a beautiful application of effective field theory. This effective field theory has two four fermion operators that describe uh, essentially the uh, two different isospin channels for the, for the, for the nucleon interactions. <laughs> Both of these four fermion operators are fine-tuned in this effective theory, officially. They're fine-tuned, one, one and around that much, one and around that much to be close to ultraviolet fixed points. Okay, that's what it takes. No, but as you said, these could be cancellations between numbers which are not fine-tuned. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. Uh, well, all, all I know is that if I imagine varying the up and down quark, and this is really the important point, these things are definitely strongly affected by up and down quark masses. They're not a property of QCD proper, <laughs> okay? So it seems to me that the next effective theory down we see some indication that involving electroweak parameters, there's some kind of tuning. Electroweak parameters are, are, are determining these things, not pure QCD. And you vary the electroweak parameters, these things will, will change. Now, David, you're right that no one has sat down and have done the official computation for how these things vary as a function of M up and M down. But it's hard to imagine, it is hard to imagine that, uh, it is hard to imagine that, uh, that, that these, um, it's hard for me to imagine that these big uh, uh, corrections come out. And as I said, in the actual effective theory, you have to fine tune coefficients to be close. So then you'd have to say that when you match that effective theory, something magical happens and makes it, uh, and puts them close to the fixed points. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, I've thought about this some too. Maybe we could discuss it uh, a, a little more later. There, 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 there are certainly some interesting, there are certainly many, maybe just in, in interest of time, if we could have this discussion. I've thought about this problem a lot, so we can, uh, we can have this discussion later. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the pion is basically irrelevant for these problems, right? Right, right. Right. But there's a hierarchy between the pion and the 
Yep, yep. So factor five, which is the sort of ones you have here. Is binary energy is small compared to the binary energy of nuclear matter? Well, but, but that's, that's exactly what's going into the estimate. What's going into the naive estimate so takes the range of the pion into, into account. Fact, right, you know, right. That the row is much heavier than the pion looks like fine-tuning. No, that's not fine-tuning, and it's, that, that's, not, that's not explaining this. No, it is fine-tuning, no. because if you change the court masses, the pion changes the line. No, that, that's not what I call fine-tuning. No, no, no. That, that's 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 perfectly fine. That's that's perfectly fine. That uh, that uh, and and in fact uh, the, the 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 problem precisely is that is that uh, it just right in the neighborhood of what the pion mass is. If we change the up and down quark masses a little, the rho meson changes little, the pion mass changes little, but the deuteron binding energy would change by a lot, and that thing would change by a lot. That's that's the problem. It's because it's a it's a. Yes, that's true. That's true. No, I'm. I, no, no, I'm just saying. It's true, no one knows. That's right. But, uh, but, but there's a very simple model for, that, you know, I, I don't want to get into a very detailed discussion of, uh, of, 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 of how tuned this is and how we do the computation. I'm very happy to uh, do it. But I'm just, I'm just pointing out that, uh, that, that the simple physical understanding, I mean, it's just literally true. The kinetic and potential energies here are canceling to 5%. You could say we'll come up with some good understanding for why they cancel to a 5%, okay? Here, here it's, they're not canceling, but they're, they're not canceling by like a part in a thousand, okay? Right. Well, I'm, it's roughly physical because it's a pretty decent non-relativistic bound state. So it's, uh, right. Yes. Yes. That is that is the claim. Yes. Yes. That's a small change. No, I mean that's a change. That's a factor of ten to ten. Well, of course, but that's enormous. No, no, but but okay. So. Just understand. Yes. Metaphor. Are you thinking of the Higgs is a bound state? No, 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 no. I'm I'm making I'm making a different comment. No, 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 no. I'm making a I'm making a different comment. I'm making a different comment. I'm saying that each one of these things, there, 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 there seems to be some, some cancellations, some kind of tuning occurs in nuclear physics. There are other things which occur, which are, which are, which are related to, to the fact that atoms exist, you know, all, all, all sorts of other things which happen. You know, all these well-known things, you make the Higgs vev a little heavier, that you have nothing but hydrogen, things get, uh, uh, you know, so that there's, all, there's all the other arguments, but I didn't even want to talk about them. I just want to say, even not saying the word anthropic once, you just look at the, you look at the numbers, you look at what, what you see, and on, certainly on the surface, it looks, like, it looks like there are cancellations, some kind of cancellations involving where electric parameters are playing an important role. Okay. Now you can ask, you can ask something else, you can ask, do these things, is there any anthropic reason for these things? Is there any reason this thing might, might happen? There, there, there may or may not be. And that, that's another discussion that we could have, but it's not germane uh, for the rest of the argument. What I really want to say is this. To the extent that you take these things as a hint for tuning, or even the arguments about the existence of atoms for a hint for tuning, it is not a hint for tuning at the 10 to the minus 30 level. It's not a hint for tuning at the 10 to the minus 20 level, but it may be a hint for tuning at a part in 100, a part in 1,000, a part in 10,000 level. I want to claim that unless you come up with a, uh, some, you know, some, some real explanation for why both of these things are fine, then it looks like there is something which is this level, but not a massive level of uh, tuning. So that's, that's all I wanted to take out of this argument. Of course, there is this, and there's all the arguments about this that we could be having, that the notion of naturalness is under great pressure from the cosmological constant. But again, I don't want to have that discussion. Uh, I really want to say that just these little circumstantial things have been pointing at a more moderate, uh, but still nonetheless existent level of tuning. And again, I didn't even mention all the other ones that five years ago when I was lecturing at this school and we had similar arguments, uh, I, I mentioned. I'm not even mentioning them, okay? The existence of atoms and all the rest of them, okay? Yes. Yes, yes, that's just what we're saying, that's right. But that, that's, but that, but that cancellation is an accident. Nothing is uh, nothing. Well, again, on the face of it, there's no symmetry that says this coupling is that coupling, and so on. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, the pion is irrelevant to this discussion. The pion is irrelevant. The pion is, irre is irrelevant to nuclear binding. So it's uh, yeah, yeah, okay. 
So now I want to talk about the scenario that we talked about back in 2004. And first, I want to just say it from the uh, top down. So the idea is that its nature is still supersymmetric uh, down at the gut scale, but that uh, it's broken in such a way that the scalars are heavy. The supersymmetric scalars are heavy. And the way we, we originally talked about it, it was hundreds of TeV or higher. We even imagined the hundreds of TeV scale was the low end of what we talked about. We imagined they might be even higher. While the fermions are light. Okay. Now, this is, first of all, possible. I'll talk more about why it's not just possible, but there's something rather, rather, rather nice about it. It's, first of all, possible because the fermions are charged under an R symmetry that the scalars don't carry. So it's possible for them to be a light while the scalars are heavy. Secondly, why should they be at the TeV scale? There's a number of reasons, but the best reason for it would now be WIMP dark matter. Okay? So WIMP, WIMP dark matter would still require the lightest of the fermions to be at the TeV scale. Now, the point is the scalars were never relevant for gauge coupling unification. So we preserve gauge coupling unification. They're not relevant for dark matter. We preserve dark matter. So those were the concrete quantitative successes of supersymmetry. But in one shot, we don't have any flavor problem. No CP problem, no moduli problem. All the phenomenological problems of SUSY are gone. If you push the scalars even to 1,000 TeV and above. And that's it. It's tuned. It's very fine-tuned. <laughs> okay? If the scalars are at 100 TeV, it's fine-tuned to a part in 10,000 or a part in 100,000. We're talking about fine-tunings in this neighborhood of a part in 10,000, a part in 100,000, a part in a million. Okay? And maybe there's a reason for that tuning. Maybe, uh, maybe it has to do with the A word. Maybe it has to do with something else. But regardless, this is a concrete theory. It's a concrete proposal. It has concrete predictions. Okay? And so it preserves these things, but uh, doesn't have the, those, those problems. And so what you could still hope to look for and find are the fermions. EDMs, actually EDMs are very nice. EDMs are, uh, EDMs normally, uh, that's why I said no CP, EDMs normally come in at one loop and are 100 times too big. With just the fermions light, EDMs arise at two loops and are fine, and actually are interesting, and could be looked for, and you know, are in the neighborhood of, the, uh, of current experimental bounds. And you should know that EDMs are a fantastic experimental frontier. There's a number of groups that, are, that have proposals to and are doing experiments that might improve the limits on the electron-electric dipole moment by a factor of 10 or 100. Dave DeMille's group at Yale was, was chugging along very nicely for a while. He ran into some systematic problems, but he's teamed up with some friends at Harvard, and I suspect they will make some, some, some progress. And I'm very excited to see what, what they'll see. So EDMs are a huge experimental frontier. It's really worth, worth, worth watching for this reason. So thank you for uh, uh, reminding me of that. OK, so that's, that's the proposed spectrum. Now. Now I want to say a few things from the top down. I'm sorry I'm going so long. I'll really wrap it up soon, Eliezer. So this kind of one loop splitting between gauge nodes and scalars, just from the top down, was a really a, oh, so, so now let's, let's imagine the most moderate version of this picture, with a sort of a loop factor splitting between scalars and gauge nodes. This kind of spectrum, just from the top down, has been a fairly ubiquitous feature of SUSY breaking models for a long time. In fact, the very first theories of SUSY breaking that people ever wrote down had this feature. And the, and the reason is obvious. You've got to do more to get the gauge of mass. You've got to break an R symmetry as well, okay? whereas you don't have to to get the scalars of mass. So just from the top down, that's something simple that, that SUSY breaking theories typically do. They don't have to, but they uh, typically do. The modern guise of this is to just imagine that we have SUSY breaking in a hidden sector. Then if that happens, but there's no special arrangements made for there to be singlets in the hidden sector and couplings and so on, if you just do that, then the gauge unit masses can only arise through something called anomaly mediation. And they're a loop factor down from the gravitino mass. But there's no reason for the scalars not to be just right up with, with where the gravitinos are. Okay? In fact, exactly when people wrote down the theories of anomaly mediation, there were two groups. There was a CERN group and there was Randall and Sundrum. Both of them discovered this fact, or pointed out this fact. The CERN group had this and was very embarrassed by it. Okay? Randall and Sundrum discovered this clever mechanism of sequestering, which made everyone more degenerate, uh, which, which, uh, which made the scalars and the gauge genomes comparable. 
It had a problem that the sleptons were tachyonic. They had a negative mass squares for the sleptons. But people flocked to that picture, even though it had this obvious problem in your face that the sleptons are tachyonic. Oh, we can fix that. It's not a problem, it's an opportunity, right? We can fix that. Uh, while on the other side, it's like, oh, poor churn guys, they just missed this more clever idea. Too bad for them, okay? So once again, not a problem, but an opportunity. But I want to say this thing is what SUSY breaking theory is in a hidden sector with no special arrangements for singlets, and it just wants to do. Okay? Now, so I want to repeat this spectrum then 100 TV scalars, TV fermions, which would involve a tuning of a part in 100,000 to a part in a million, is. I will say polemically, is what SUSY breaking models want to do. It's what they've been telling us what they want to do for 20 years. We haven't let them do it. We want them to do something else. So the alternative is just let them. Let them do what they want to do and see what happens. What is the consequence? Okay. This is the consequence. So this is, this is the prediction that was made. The predictions were made right back, of course, these things are all trivial, as I said, they were made right back when these models were first written down, but people have uh, refined them since. This was a prediction that, that this was the, the computation was done at the requisite two-loop accuracy by Judice and Strumia back in uh, September. And so, as a function of where the superpartners are, this is the prediction for the Higgs mass, okay, on the vertical axis, okay? So here is 10 TeV, here is a million Oh, there's 1,000 TeV, okay? And the band here is what 125 GeV Higgs wants, okay? So you see that if, if we let, if we, if we have this kind of picture, 100 TeVs in the middle here, so 10 to 1,000, the Higgs wants to be near 125 GeV, okay? That was, as I said, that was a prediction right from the get-go. We said in our paper, the Higgs should be 120 GeV or heavier. So that was already dangerous. There's, there was all the hints that there was 115 GV Higgs at lap and so on. We said it should be 120 GV or heavier. It's where, it's perfectly nice spot here. These different contours depend on tan beta. So if tan beta is moderate, where it's sitting down here, perfectly nice spot. If you want to go all the way up to around 1,000, uh, tan beta has got to be very close to one. That's the sort of bottom line here, which means that the quartic at the high scale has got to be pretty close to zero. So I think this is, it's, this is why I find the 125 GV number so interesting from this point of view. It tells you on the one hand, the scalars want to be heavy, but they can't be too heavy. So it's not some super duper radical version of this picture with a million TeV scalars and 10 to the 20 fine tuning. It's forcing you into this pretty moderate, you know, 10 to 100, 10 to 1,000 TeV range. And 1,000, you even have, have to start talking about some reasons why the quartic coupling should be so, so close to zero. So to my mind, you know, 200 TeV stops, it's just perfect. All right, yes? What are the bands already? From what? No, I mean, of course, we have no idea what, I mean, here we're talking about very, for, 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 for the gluinos, well, the, the bound on the squarks are roughly one TeV. So we're talking about, of course, the whole idea is that, uh, the whole idea is that we're not gonna see the squarks in this picture, right? So, yes? Okay, very good. So this, this, this is, uh, in, this, in this moderate neighborhood, they could either be light or heavy. It doesn't much change the unification picture, and it depends on your picture for what dark matter it wants to be, okay? So they could be heavy, they could be light. Uh, um, 100 TV. So, so really, I'll, I'll say a little bit about it in a second. I really have no idea why this is taking me so long. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, so here's another view of exactly the same thing. Uh, I won't, I won't go, go, go through it. It just shows more exactly the same point. So to me, somewhat remarkably, I mean, I, I should say, in waiting for the Higgs results to uh, come out, all the rumors a long time ago, for example, there was the, anyway, everything that seemed to, to favor a Higgs lighter than 120 was making me nervous for, the, for these theories, right? Uh, so, but 125 is just great. I'm, I'm very happy with it. And it points to the most moderate, if you want to take this picture seriously at all, it points to the most moderate version of it. Not the most radical version, but the most moderate version with scalars in this range, which is also the range of what SUSY theories want to do, okay? Now, one of the smoking guns of this picture that we pointed out um, 
was that if the scalars are heavy, if the, particularly the squarks are heavy, I mean, you could say, how will we know if the squarks are heavy? You know, so maybe we're lucky and we produce the gauginos, we produce the gluinos, we produce the, the hexinos. But how would we know this is a theory? How do we know it's, n it's not some random particles? How do we know the scalars are even there anywhere? How do we know that they're heavy? How do we know they're not right around the corner? We just missed them, they're at 60 EV, right? Well, there is a smoking gun. This is a smoking gun that, uh, that we're excited about then, which is that if the squarks are heavy, then the gluino should be long-lived. The reason is that the only way the gluino can decay is through an off-shell squark. And if these guys are heavy, then the lifetime is long. The lifetime can be so long that it travels for around a millimeter or a tenth of a millimeter or so and could leave an observably displaced vertex, or even longer. It could even do much more exotic things if it really lived long, it could end up in the detector, get stuck, blow up, uh, I mean, decay, all sorts of wonderful things could happen. Um, but anyway, but that's a basic point, is that the gluino could be long-lived, and this is what the numbers have got to be. If it's going to be displaced enough to be visible at the LHC, the mass difference between the top and the bottom of the spectrum, which is what goes into the decay rate formula, delta m to the fifth, okay, the mass difference, if the mass, the mass, the squark mass has got to be heavier than around 500 TeV in the regime where this delta m is right around 1 TeV, okay? So this tells you something, that if we're in this neighborhood of this moderate split, it is not guaranteed, even if we discover the gluino, it is not guaranteed that we'll see displacement, unfortunately. Okay? Yes? Uh, that's what I'm coming to in just a moment. Okay? That's just what I'm coming to in just a moment. You're absolutely correct, uh, and I'm just coming to it in a moment. Okay? <laughs> But if it is discovered, this is what it would have to be. And what I, the only important point I want to point out is it's not the mass of the gluino itself, it's the delta m, which is what matters for this argument. Okay? So you might see it, you might not see it, but, uh, but uh, that's, that's what it takes. So this is exactly uh, the question. The obvious worry in this picture is what I mentioned at the beginning. The WIMP miracle could mean hexenos at 1 TeV or winos at 3 TeV. If that's the bottom of the spectrum, forget it. right? That's the bottom of the spectrum. Typically, in these theories, you know, especially in anomaly mediation, those of you who know, the, the, the lightest, the bottom to top ratio is a factor of nine. It's huge. So absolutely forget it. Okay? If this is it, we, want it, we won't ever see even fermionic superpartners. Actually, uh, in this case, it's even worse than that. If the hexeno is at one TV, it'll eventually be seen in xenon, in direct dark matter detection, if it's a dark matter. If it's a Wino, it's 3 TV, it won't even be seen at xenon, okay? Uh, it's, 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 uh, it, 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 it's scattering off the nuclei, goes at one loop, and anyway, uh, the cross-section is too small, it won't even be seen at xenon. This is the true, true nightmare scenario, okay? WIMP miracle, there is a WIMP there, it's a 3 TV, we won't see it in direct detection, we won't see it at the LHC, that is the nightmare scenario, okay? So, possible. However, there's one ray of hope already, which I really like. Let's take the absolute nightmare. This absolute nightmare would have the Wino down there, the Gluino 10 times heavier, so the Gluino is at 30, and then the Gravitino would already be at 3,000. That's starting to make the scalars too heavy. <laughs> Remember, they want to be lighter than 1,000. They're being squeezed from both ends. So there are some arguments already against this most nightmare scenario. This starts getting things too heavy. Okay? But anyway, let's, let's, let's keep, keep going. Now, there's two immediate comments I want to make about this that, uh, before saying what I want to say. First is that we could have a relic only constitute part of the dark matter, with the rest being, let's say, axions. And there's many, there's, this sounds like, like a silly thing, but there's many good reasons that this might happen I could tell you about later, but this would obviously lower the bottom of the spectrum. Okay, so that's fine. A second point is that it might not be a thermal relic. Okay? In fact, especially in this sort of picture, there are naturally hundreds of TeV moduli lying around. Uh, these moduli normally cause moduli problems, but with all the scales much, much higher, the moduli problems aren't there anymore. The moduli tend to decay before Big Bang nucleosynthesis, so they don't screw up BBN. However, they still decay late enough that they wipe out the relic abundance that's generated from standard freeze-up. That, 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 that just typically happens. Okay? Again, this has been known for a long, long time, 
But in the context specifically of these theories with a moderately split spectrum, uh, this was studied by, uh, it was the first project I gave my, my student, Jared Kaplan. Um, so he studied this problem in that, in that context uh, uh, back in 2005. And he found a really interesting result. That the dark matter particles decay and they repopulate, uh, sorry, the moduli decay and they repopulate dark matter. So that's, that's where the dark matter really comes from, is from the decay of the moduli. You would think there's no WIP miracle anymore, there's no reason for them to be at a TeV, but it turns out, numerically, they need to be in, not only at a TeV, but even lighter. Okay? So, you know, a few hundred GeV we knows are perfect, are just fine. They're not a relic, but they come from the decay of moduli. I should say that th this, this is also something uh, so, 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 uh, uh, um, so uh, Gordy Kane has been talking about theories with exactly this kind of spectrum for the last two or three years. Um, and uh, he also has this point, all these things are, so as I said, th this is a spectrum and a kind of thing that has shown up in many, many, many places. Uh, this particular point was already, has been known for a long time and this context was made by, by Jared already back in 2005. So it's interesting that it still favors TV dark matter. So both of these things could lower the spectrum and things could be a lot better. But I want to continue to pursue, I want to take an attitude. The attitude I'm taking in this talk is just do the most vanilla possible thing from the point of view of not being clever, not model building, just let the theory do what it wants to do and see what happens. So I don't want to model build and worry about moduli. Let's just say it's a thermal relic and see what happens. So. So this is, I want to go back to the nightmare scenario, okay? So again, this is, this is the nightmare scenario. That's what we said. The Wino could be, the Higgsino could be down here, the Wino above it somewhere, Gluino at 10. Yeah, yes. Considering you reached two thirds of your talk. Oh, sorry, if yeah. I measure it according to the slides. Yes, uh, you shouldn't measure it according to the slides. Uh, I, I will literally be five more minutes. Okay. Or we can make a break and then continue. Uh, oh, you mean just clap and continue? Yeah, yeah. okay, sure, <laughs> that, 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 that's fine. Uh, okay. Um, I will end in real five minutes. I will end in I will end in in, in, in in real five minutes. All right. Sorry. I really don't. I'm I'm really sorry. I have no idea. That I, I gave this talk before in a half hour, so I have no idea how this is taking so long. I think I think. Uh, I really. That may be. That's right. That, that's that 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 that. Sorry. Uh, but but can I just officially end it, just so there's no funniness? Uh, Okay, so let, let me just say, the standard, what, what you would think of as a standard picture looks really bad, but the, the most standard, what people normally call the standard picture, always has this annoying mu problem, that they don't know why the Higginos are light. Let's really let the theory do what it wants to do, which is to have a Judice mass zero mass for the Higginos as well. There's just some term in the Kähler potential, there's there, there's no reason for it not to be there, that would give the Higginos a mass up at the Gravitino mass, so let's let it happen. What happens? Something cool happens, um, which is that the spectrum starts getting, for accidental reasons that have to do with the values of the actual beta functions and things like that, okay? The spectrum starts to get quite a bit squeezed, not horrendously squeezed, but quite a bit squeezed from what you'd expect. Oh, I should say, all the things in this talk that are not, have not been trivially known for uh, 10 or 20 years, are some work in progress with David E. Kaplan. So this is these last few, few comments. It's not a big deal, but, uh, uh, but I think it, it, it does have some important implications. So this is what the spectrum looks like. If you just let it do it, okay? It gets squeezed so it's like a factor of now three splitting between the top and the bottom of the spectrum and not a factor of nine. That's still bad if the Wino is two and a half. I made it three there. Wino is two and a half, the Gluino is a seven and a half. That's not so hot. Definitely not gonna be seen at the 14 TV LHC. May be seen at a 28 TV LHC, okay? So that's, uh, may well be seen at 28 TV, so we can talk about that later. But uh, certainly won't be seen at a 14 TV LHC. Okay, so uh, I'm, you know, I'm, not, uh, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture or not, I just wanna see what happens, okay? But let's see, now let's imagine, up at the scale M3 halves, we might have other things lying around. There might be additional vector-like matter. We might have additional five plus five bars, okay? Those five plus five bars, we don't want to have a mu problem for them. Everyone has a Judice mass zero mass. Every vector-like thing around has a Judice mass zero mass. And then things start getting a lot more interesting. The squeezing starts becoming more dramatic. 
for any number of messengers between one and five, which is the maximum number you can have beyond which unification doesn't make sense, the spectrum gets really squeezed. And this is what it looks like. First of all, very often the Gluino gets lighter than everyone else. Okay? So here's a picture. Okay? Um, here, uh, in, in some of these pictures, I'm floating whether the Hexino is up there or not. Okay? But, uh, but it doesn't much matter in, in, uh, in uh, detail. So anyway, this is, this is one spectrum. Here's another spectrum. Actually, this, this case is very interesting. With two messengers, the Hexino's up there, everyone up there. They really all turn out to be remarkably degenerate. Within hundreds of GeV, even though the overall scale, within 200 GeV, even though the all, overall scale could be two or three TeV, they could even get a little more degenerate than that. And it's just, uh, it's not particularly, it's not, I'm not saying horribly fine, but the splitting is fairly significant. Sorry, the, the compression is fairly significant. And this is what we found, that for any number of messengers, this, the, the ratio, of, as long as it's not zero, the splitting between the top and the bottom of the spectrum, regardless of where the hexenos are, never exceeds two and a half. So that's very encouraging. Okay? In this picture, even the nightmare scenario for what the bottom of the spectrum is will offer the ability to see certainly the colored partners eventually, even at, the four, at 14 TeV. And the thing that I like the most is that in the cases where we get these happy accidents with this kind of splitting, with these particularly small splittings, although it doesn't have to be, I mean, this is a particularly extreme example, but the point is that, that, it, it, that, that even with the, let's say, the Wino and the Gluino at two or two and a half TV, the splitting is 200 GeV, okay? And that means that we can see long-lived Gluinos again, basically over the whole range, if that happens, because it was delta M that entered the formula. So even if the scalar is 100 or, uh, or 50 or 100 or 500, if the delta M is two or 300 GeV, then we're still in the regime where we should be looking for long-lived Gluinos. They're not long-lived to end up in the middle of the, of the detector. They're decaying like you know, a millimeter or a centimeter from the vertex. This is a very, very hard thing to look for. It's on no one's front burner right now for very good reasons, but we should be looking for it. So th these are very, very interesting decays. Hard, uh, they're not as easy as the most dramatic ones with the gluinos getting stuck in the uh, detector, but it's really something to look for. And I think, at least to my mind, it's back on the table, um, uh, even in the kind of more pessimistic uh, sounding pictures for what might be happening. Oh, yeah. No, I know, no, but, 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 but this, well, we can talk a little more in, in detail, but this, the, the, but the, the sort of tenth of a millimeter to a centimeter range is, uh, especially if it goes as it can reasonably do to, uh, to uh, tops, is, is challenging, and, but very interesting, so, so, uh, and, and should be dedicated to look for. I know some of it is being looked for, but, uh, but, um, uh, but that's the sort of thing that we're, that we're talking about. All right, and I should say, this is all just in the direction of no cleverness, no extra structure, nothing. Just let it do what it wants to do. As I said, I'm not necessarily painting a rosy picture. It's not guaranteed, it could suck, but it definitely doesn't have to. The, the, the spectrum, once you start thinking even slightly more detail about what the physics might, up there might look like, and take it more seriously and actually write down reasonable theories and see what they want to do, you find that the spectrum is much, much more squeezed than people uh, typically talk about. Okay, so, uh, and there's the, the final comment is the physics of flavor in this region of 10 to 1,000 TeV scalars is amazingly interesting. This would be a whole other three-hour talk at the pace that I'm going. Uh, but, but let me just make a general comment. There's entirely new possibilities opened up for flavor physics, not just signals, strange new signals that we don't normally talk about, for one thing, but also, from the top down, it's possible that the structure of the standard model fermion masses is actually dominated by what you would call Susie slop, integrating out the scalars in this 10 to 1,000 TeV range can actually radiatively generate a significant part of the standard model fermion mass hierarchy. That was a possibility. It was a possibility that was near and dear to my heart as a graduate student that I worked on very hard uh, and never worked with natural Susie. Because in that scenario, you're always, by the time you arrange to get large, large enough effects for the fermion masses, you were dead from flavor changing neutral currents. 
However, the fermion mass effects are dimensionless. They just depend on ratios of scales, but the FCNCs decouple. And so if you imagine the scales are up at 10 to 100 TV, really whole new pictures for, for uh, generating fermion masses become possible that we normally don't think about. And they're associated with extremely interesting experimental signals. For example, in a usual theory, no one would ever talk about seeing tau to E gamma before seeing tau to mu gamma. In this kind of theory, you could easily see tau to E gamma and never see tau to mu gamma. Okay? So, there, so the, there's patterns of flavor violation that both have a size that's interesting and a pattern that's very unusual. But anyway, that would be a whole other talk. But this is my conclusion. The Higgs in this regime at zeroth order looks supersymmetric. At first order, we can, we can still have a choice between pretty natural theories. Um, what, what it was before with LEP plus one extra addition, perfectly fine. Or uh, the scenario that I talked about here, which from my, from my point of view I like because it's letting the, the top-down theory do the simplest thing it wants to do. And while we do these things and have things that we don't call tunings, like having an extra U1 and having a singlet and have these couplings what they are, we say those aren't tunings, but electroweak symmetry breaking is fine. Maybe from some bigger point of view, you see, here this isn't even some kind of landscape discussion that says whether you favor high scale or low scale SUSY breaking. It's all low energy SUSY. But it's a detailed difference between whether models of SUSY breaking do or don't generate gauge genome masses at, uh, comparable to scalar masses or one loop suppressed. And at that fine level of distinction, I don't know how to, how to decide. I'm not even advocating one or the other. I'm just saying they're both interesting possibilities. Had the Higgs been at 100, at 115 or even at 120, this would look worse. Okay? But 125 is looking pretty good for this in its moderate in its really moderate uh, picture. And it's looking pretty good for that too. So, so, and nothing else is looking any good. That's the other really Im uh, important point. Composite Higgs is, you know, never mind Technicolor, uh, these things, I think, this is really the supersymmetric neighborhood, okay? And, uh, and what I'm talking about at the end here are, you know, sort of uh, interfamily squabbles. But, uh, but uh, anyway, all right. So, uh, as I said, any deviation in sigma times branching curve for the Higgs would instantly demolish the picture of the second half of my talk. Definitely not moderate split Susie, okay? A factor of 150% discrepancy in sigma times branching ratio, split Susie is dead, 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 okay? So it's, we don't need to, we see, of course, you see a single, you see a single slepton or a single squark, it's dead as well. But I'm saying, even forgetting about that, just studying the properties of the Higgs could easily kill this idea just in the next year. Well, because, because, uh, because uh, to have a deviation in sigma times branching ratio in any of these theories, you need additional light stuff, additional light scalars in particular. So that's, that's, that's really the point. Okay, and so, but I really want to conclude by saying in every possible way, this is an amazingly exciting time in fundamental physics. Obviously, experimentally, all these wonderful things going on theoretically. I really wish, you know, I started grad school in a period of time like this uh, rather than the, uh, well, it wasn't such a bad time, I guess, for me either, but, but it would, it's still better now. It's still, it's still much, much better now. So you guys are all, they go, those of you who are grad students are damn lucky and you should be grateful and should work your asses off because if you don't, we'll be very, very pissed off that you're squandering this amazing opportunity. Um, and of course, we all wait on pins and needles for the 8TV run in 2012. Thank you very much.